invisible forces? Mind control? If I gotta do it, I'ma do the most. Since they paid to see a show, got the South overflow. Yeah. If I gotta do it, I'ma do the most. Watching me to take no raise of toast to the goat. Yeah. What if I told you that some of the best designers in the world are secretly drawing invisible lines on their projects? Lines that you can't see, but your brain can't ignore. These lines guide your clicks, your eyes, your brains, and possibly even your wallets. Welcome to the psychology of leading lines. What are these lines? I've been talking about this phenomenon since at least 2023, but I recently got reminded about it by this very nicely done tweet. So let's talk about leading lines and why they are an essential tool in all pro designer workflows. I'll also show you a couple of ways to experiment with these, break some of the rules potentially, and how to test and measure whether that has an effect. And of course, there is an important twist at the end of this video, so keep watching. Leading lines are visual cues like arrows, lines, curves, and even sometimes how the text is wrapped that tell your brain and your eyes where to look next. Done right, they make browsing a website effortless. But if they're done badly, that can lead to very high cognitive load and people clicking away. Take a look at this classic example on how just the font size actually guides the order by which you read, regardless of position. Leading lines also exist in nature. It's mostly something called perspective combined with the natural shape of things. It works the same way in web design. But how do you do it like a pro? First, let's take a look at how some of the biggest and best marketing brands in the world approach leading lines. They all do it to move your eye to a specific spot. I'll give you a couple of examples and annotate it with those lines drawn on top and explain why they work. And then we're gonna show you some bad examples on how not to do it because this is gonna hurt the conversion, the performance, and people are just gonna hate these sites. There are multiple reading lines in this example, but first let's look at how exactly we read it from left to right. We obviously start at the very top, but then we have to shift to the left to the very big text and it catches our attention the same way that example of you will look here first does. But then a very interesting thing happens. The next line under the big text is shorter and then the button itself is even shorter and in a different color. So with every new element, our mind mentally shifts a little to the right, so it goes diagonally exactly towards the button. But here the visual, the photo of the watch, also serves a very important function. There are thinner diagonal lines going towards the larger centerpiece in the middle and we usually follow from smaller to larger. That means that even if we look down at the watch, our gaze will follow it upwards again towards the button. And in this case, the watch is nicely curved, which also curves the line that we're following. And look where that line leads. Yeah. Basically, all visual cues on this website lead toward the small buy button. But it's also blue, the only colorful thing on that image, so it catches attention. But look what happens if we change the description text to be longer and wider than the longer text. Where does the gaze naturally go next? Yeah, it goes completely away from the button. And we really like to follow visual cues like that. So in that case, the Apple Watch band will actually let us follow it with our eyes, but downward, even further away from the button. Okay, but we need to talk about this. Does it mean that nobody will see or click the button anymore in this case? No, that's not the point. That only means that it's gonna take you longer to go mentally and visually and optically back to that button, which means that for some people it might just not happen. They might not click it. This version doesn't completely destroy conversion, but it definitely makes it a little bit harder. Let's do another very quick, but also pretty interesting example. We start the same way, from a smaller title back to the larger text. But what happens next is also interesting. 
Because if we applied logic to this, we would say that the gaze will then follow like these arrows point, so also away from the button. But that is not the case, because the background is dark and the laptop itself is also dark, so we kind of skip the laptop image and focus on something else here. Our eye catches on to the next bright and shiny object on the path, which is the edges of the glowing display. But then the dark laptop blends with the dark background and we mostly focus on that colorful glare and that glare is triangular and pointing downward, toward the button. A trick that I also talk a lot about in the square black blueprint is to blur the image and then see what our brain processes, because this is a great way. As you can see, now you don't really even see the laptop anymore, but you do see that colorful shape. And because we have plenty of white space around the entire thing, the button just shines there. It's also the same shade of blue on most of Apple's sites, so it's instantly recognizable. But when we inverted the laptop to be white, now the focus goes to the very edges of the display on each side, and then directly down, it doesn't go to the button anymore. And Apple does have a very light silver laptop, but they didn't use it here on purpose, because of the leading lines principle. Now let's quickly talk about a non-Apple product. Linear used to have a pretty complex website with heavy visuals in the header, but they realized that going simple is actually better. Because it is an app tailored for a specific audience, it shows the app image, which is not always a good idea. I also fully talk about why in the Square Black Blueprint, but here it works. So now let's follow the gaze. We start reading the large text, and as you notice, it is slightly longer in the top line. Then our gaze reverses, because the description is slightly shorter and then the button row is even shorter, but we also have a guiding line in form of the angle of the screen. And because the screen fades out to black on the right side, the eye goes back towards the brighter points again, and in this case, all the way towards the button. And these little details is what makes all the difference. I talk even more about this in the Square Block Blueprint and how to package this and things like this into a value for your clients so you can charge them more. Link in the description. Here is some bad examples of messy, chaotic structure that makes your brain be all over the place and get pretty frustrated. Because brains are lazy, they want guidance, they don't want to process a big chunk of information all at once, and when they get tired like that, people click away. This is a classic did I cook garbage AI generated image design. Plenty of these on socials and they're all bad. First notice how jacked the right edge is, it just goes left and right and left and right and it makes our brains tired. Then we notice a person and the person is looking a little towards the left, but in this case the brightest point is the sun, so the person is looking at the sun, not at the text and not at the button. And all the other visible lines on that image all point away from the button too. So here is another example. People love generating those beautiful images of houses with AI and then adding some vague copy next to it. But what happens here? The text is actually arranged into a rather nice funnel. It goes down towards the button. But the problem is that we have a pretty vibrant visible image on the right. So our attention naturally shifts to the right from the text and see what happens here. Every little part of that image is screaming for you to look to the right, as far away from the button as possible, and we have a brightly colored car in that direction that's gonna capture all of the attention. And I'm using these exaggerated examples on purpose, because with exaggeration you can spot patterns and then avoid those patterns in your own work. Have you noticed, the more complex a visual is, the more of these lines start to form. This is why most products showing a complex dashboard right in the header fail to convert. Because not only it doesn't show the users how it will solve their problem, it's also a complex mess of lines going in all directions for the brain to process. Adding an image like that right in the header smacks you in the face with complexity. I talked about these for years. Remember my LinkedIn redesign? If not, here is a quick refresher.
Today we're gonna talk about one of the worst landing page hero sections in the world. Let's redesign this. But of course you can watch the full video on the LinkedIn redesign because there is also a lot of really cool insights in there, link in the description. Now I've been experimenting with leading lines for a very long time. So what are the guiding or leading lines? These lines are not magic, they are psychology. Our brains are wired to follow cues, whether it's a road, a river or an Apple Watch ad. And we as designers can use them wisely to reduce friction and increase conversions. And here's the twist. These rules aren't prisons. You can bend or break them sometimes, and that can create surprise or memorability. But it has to be done right. It has to be done without increasing the cognitive load. The secret is knowing when to guide the eyes and when to disrupt and mislead for a brief second before guiding to a different place. For now, look for these lines, learn to spot them, learn how the best ones do it, and then try to incorporate them in your work. And if you want to sell it better to clients, then I talk all about it in the Square Black Blueprint. Next time, I'll show you another invaluable trick. One that shapes how you feel about the design before you read a single word. So subscribe if you want to see the psychology of design uncovered. And obviously, have a beautiful day.